Welcome everyone to Move Crush Count, a podcast produced by JNL Marketing. We've got a special guest today, the athletic director of the University of Louisville, Vince Tyra. Thank you. Happy Welcome, to be here. Vince. Yeah. yeah. Pleasure. So, uh, great thing here. We're in Vince's house, actually. We're in Cardinal Stadium right here on the 50 yard line. You get a great view while we're talking. It's beautiful. So, today's podcast, all right, is all about how to build a winning culture. Vince is an expert in this thing. He's done an incredible job in a very short period of time at the University of Louisville. So let's dive right in. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It certainly takes a lot of, uh, as I say, process. And yeah. I think that uh, you got to get a lot of collaboration and buy-in to, to make that work. But, um, you know, there's some, there's some key things that I think we've done here um, from day one besides just looking at the organization. But you've got to have people that want to be here and be a part of this kind of process. And and if they're not, you gotta you gotta take care of that too. And I and I think that we find, uh, you know, those who want to be here. And I always say the, the analogy: the grass will kill the weeds. Yeah. And my view on that is, if you're doing all the things right and you have the right culture in place, um, it it's infectious to others. Yeah. And those who don't enjoy that, they'll leave. Those are the weeds. And I and I want to bring this into perspective a little bit. I've got a business leader audience, right? Mm-hmm. And they're sitting there. Why are you? interviewing an athletic director, right? So let's go in a little bit about your background, your education, your yeah. experience level, so they understand where you're coming from and that you're someone they should be listening to. Yeah, well, I, I'll work a little backwards. Before I got into this role, and uh, I was in private equity, was a managing partner of a, equity, a private equity firm that had a mezzanine debt fund as well as an equity fund. So, you know, we invested in a number of companies. Uh, their debt fund today has about 19 portfolios in the equity side, and the current fund, which is a newer one, probably has a half dozen in that. So in that role, I'm, I'm usually chairman of the board. You run the deals, and you sit in there, and um, you go look, look at deals, but you got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the print. you got to be thoughtful about who you're going to partner with and understand, understand industry dynamics and opportunities there. Uh, so that's been part of my business background. Prior to that, I was CEO of a Bain Capital portfolio, which is most people uh, connotate that with Mitt Romney, uh, who founded Bain Capital and yeah. uh, took a company that was a few hundred million to a billion. And prior to that, uh, was at a younger age, was president of Fruit of Loom, uh, which uh, thankfully back then they didn't have Google and they could search all the things about me and age and all that because I was... I started as an executive vice president at 31, became president six months later of a division, which is about 900 million of their 2.4 billion, and then became president over um, all of it. And uh, so I was fortunate to get a lot of experience at a young age, but I had great mentors that taught me a lot about really what to do and what not to do as well yeah. to, to build a culture. But I think you kind of shape that along the way with your own experience. Yeah, and so a lot of our audience, the reason they tune in is because they really want to discover, you know, how can they differentiate themselves? They're struggling right now. Uh, you know, our key, our, the majority of our customers are auto dealers mm-hmm. and auto manufacturers. And the internet has really done a number uh, marginalizing and kind of commoditizing them, or at least is trying to. And so the dealers and, and the manufacturers are winning, well, doing a great job in winning at this battle, uh, have really embraced and looked at not what is this doing to me, but uh, where are the opportunities and where can we expand you know, a lot more than what we have in the past. And so I really believe that one of the ways to differentiate your business, your athletic department, whatever it might be, would be culture. And so talk to us a little bit about how your experience in the business world helped you translate to your current you know, how did that well, translate to your current role? Yeah, because along the way, I've been in distribution businesses and manufacturing where, you know, the margins are lean. Yeah. Um, your competitors may, in some cases, have like products, um, which was a distribution company I ran for Bain Capital. So, um, but we grew exponentially while others didn't. And we came up with ways how to win all ties. And I think that we wanted their experience um, to be terrific with us. So when they, uh, walked into a will call, the person they talked to, they had a feel of what we were all about. If they were on the phone placing an order, they knew what we were all about. If they had a problem with an order um, and they wanted to send it back, we knew, if we knew we were being gamed at times, we kind of taught when you should let it go yeah. and when you should try to deal with it in a productive way. But um, 
so we always had a way of people getting to know us. We personalized our business uh, when they were calling an 800 number and or placing an order online because that a third of our business went through the uh, online ordering. But yeah, I think that you know how you figure out how that how you differentiate that is a is a different nuance. And I've sp- spoken recently to GE Appliances. Uh, top customers in in North America on a on a variety of things about this about how to teach and and how you're doing things different than your competition and I'm talking about more like you get into culture the experience that your customer has and then dealerships like my personal experience walking into a dealership it's I already know if it's if I'm buying a Ford I'm buying a Ford you know at all you of them got the same inventory already. yeah I've done my research but going in there the difference for that customer is how they feel when someone approaches them. Yeah. Are they relaxed? Do they feel comfortable with the process? Uh, were they treated with respect, uh, even when there's confrontation? Because in but in that you know buying a car, there's there's conflict management to deal with, right? Yeah. So we teach empathy here. So even if a season ticket holder is upset with something, we teach our people people to have empathy for them. What is their situation? Why do they feel that way? Were they treated poorly? You know, before you were on the phone, with, treated poorly in their past. Is there something that's making them act the way they act in the middle of renewing season ticket or buying a car? So I got to tell you, all right, what you just said is actually 100% true. And your, your people, I'm going to give you some kudos here. All right. So we've got the new ticket system online. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. And I, I'm somewhat tech savvy. My my son back here would disagree with me, but <laughs> but uh, you know I'm trying to transfer my tickets to actually Alex over here behind the camera. All right, and I had some issues, human error. All right, yep. and so I'm calling up because I first off I had trouble getting them loaded to my account, but I didn't know what I was doing. Right. All right, so I call and I'm upset because why can't I just have my printed tickets? Right. Yeah. This is for the women's game. And I and I, uh, I sit there, and as soon as I answer the phone, it was the nicest, completely calmed me. The moment I picked up, the moment they picked up the phone, took about three seconds to fix, and that was it, done. Yeah. But it was non-confrontational, and it was not what I expected because typically, you know, a lot of times when you call this, this is students or, or younger people are always answering the phone they haven't been in the business world they don't always know how to handle those situations right but it was out it was actually outstanding customer service so that doesn't happen by accident right yeah you know that and I think that so we bring all our Cardinal athletic fund and our seat our ticket selling group and all that and ticket operations all in a room and we educate them we train them and teach them about what's new what's going on technology how does it tie in with Ticketmaster how does it not and that's coming from me, so I can sit in the room and I'll go through that process and then we'll have others in our department talk about why this is important, why this is valuable, and then kind of disseminate the difference in our customers. You versus somebody who's Zach's age, at, you know, early 20s versus somebody who's 65 who's been a 30 year season ticket holder. So we go through that, but it's to understand the variance of this and not be ready with the answer, but be quick to listen and slow to speak outstanding so they can hear what you're saying and they can answer it better if they let you breathe talk and maybe even vent so how has this so that's great on from a customer service standpoint right how has it impacted the culture here and I'm assuming this you didn't invent it here this is something you probably brought right, with you brought with me yes. all right so here and then in the, even in your in your past life uh, how has this impacted the actual culture of the companies you've been involved with well I think the same thing you know it has to start with me I got to walk that walk and uh, I've always been one to make fun of myself and uh, in any of the roles but but I do take it I'm very serious about analytics and studying and using technology and all that uh, to help make decisions um, but it's always been one where I've been incredibly transparent um, and that's happening here we share the budget with anybody uh, obviously the to the degree we'll share it. We have budget workshops. Any employee wants to come, they can come. Wow. Um, you know, and it all started with when I got here, uh, I had to use my own words. You know, I had to be quick to listen, slow to speak. So hearing what's going on and what I felt was maybe different from my style, I wouldn't say missing, but different from my style and how I felt we should represent ourselves. We went through probably six months of me sorting things out. And then to be honest, we had an organizational change. 
because I want it to be directly uh, on behalf of the student athletes and where that organizational chart should be developed to support them. And I've got six new direct reports now. We also have seven new head coaches here um, and some for varied reasons. But what I'm getting to is, and through that change, we've changed the culture as well about how we're gonna go about treating each other, treating our, all our constituents, whether they be donors, you know, fans certainly, the academic side of campus, in the community, and how we're gonna represent ourselves. And that starts with how we teach that. It, you, you can teach that process, uh, you can. Um, that's why I believe in dealing with NCAA issues, process will trump penalties. And, and I wanna get into some of the, in a second here, but first I still wanna get in, dive into a little bit of some of the challenges you've dealt with and how you mm -hmm. handled them. Uh, eventually I wanna get into at least your three key principles yeah. to elevate or improve a culture. Um, but let me ask you this. And so you, you have a situation here where you followed uh, some popular coaches, mm -hmm. you, some not, one not so popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but a very popular athletic director. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give this analogy and you tell me where I'm missing. It's almost like when you step into this role merging two companies where you've got the one company still wanting to do it the way it was versus the new way. Yes. Because you've only been doing this how long? A little over two years. Yeah, so it's a short window. Yeah. But the change was almost immediate. And yes. so how did that happen? Yeah, so, you know, I think you got to What were the have, challenges well, and what did you yeah, do? Yeah, there was yeah. a lot of challenges, as you know. I mean, there were people who, you know, Tom did a terrific job here as our yep. AD and had a, had a great following and, and so forth. But um, and, and we had some dynamic coaches, but we also had some dynamic issues, yep. uh, ones that I hope, you know, we never have to repeat. So I came in with it, that mentality of how are we going to do things to never have to deal with those issues again? Uh, I didn't get here because things were good. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we systematically have taken in the past how you go about changing things to make it uh, better. And you you put in those, you know, you have key principles like we're, we can chat about. Um, but what I did initially is because I could see there wasn't a lot of professional development going on in the department, and I'd been from the business world, not from the athletic world, but then in my first meetings with athletic departments, ACC or otherwise, I could see a lot of young people in control, a lot of, a lot of young people in positions of power, but maybe not properly trained to make all those decisions. And I think our group would admit they, they probably weren't either. So after about, you know, I should say, I was here like 30 days and quickly went to the business school and I funded it created a ethical leadership excellence program in the business school, used Dean Meridian and uh, Professor Ryan Quinn, who's an expert in ethics, to come over and said, I'm gonna have you train our athletic department. Here's my cultural values. I'm accustomed to having a value-based company that creates goals and so forth. Okay, well, after like five months came, I started October 3rd to 17 in February, we did a restructuring of the organization and how we're gonna go about it in lines of uh, authority and communication. But at that same time, I sent the top 20 leaders of the athletic department off for a one day retreat uh, with Professor Quinn. And I said, we're gonna go off, we're gonna develop our values and our, our goals here, and then we'll take those and refine them with the rest of the department. What they didn't realize is I wasn't going with them. So the 20 of them went with Professor Quinn I gave him my what I thought our goals and values should be, told him to stick them in his back pocket, and at the end of the day, compare notes. And it's a way to check me, accountability for me. Am I doing the right thing? Are they getting what I'm preaching? And It doesn't matter what your goals are if your team doesn't buy in. You got it. Yeah. So that's, that's a, also an ego check, right? So yeah. you, they came back at the end of the day, and he called me, and he goes, I got great news. You're almost spot on the goals, and you're pretty close in the values. There's like five or six of the values that are damn near spot on. So then what that led to is another day off site with me. We refined them. We took them to the whole athletic department, 300 plus employees in an auditorium. I introduced our goals and values and said, here's how we came up with them. And here's where we're going. And you have a say. Anonymous survey is going to go out. You tell us if we got a word wrong or a thought wrong and all that. That was bait. 
That bait was to get them to respond, which 60% on the nose respond, 59.87% responded to the survey with their thoughts. The bait was, out of that usually comes your key initiatives. Because if you read their comments, not only do they tell you what they think the values and goals should be, why they should be that way, and what's missing. That came three key initiatives out of that, professional development, equity, comp uh, equity compensation, and budget transparency. We put steering committees behind those three and said, you come up with, out of these key initiatives, how we're going to accomplish this, and you tell me how those tie back to the individual goals and values. And underneath that became things like conflict management that we taught under professional development, and they told us which values and goals that aligned with. I, I think it's interesting that, I, first of all, I love to see, and I think it's very interesting that the athletic department reached out to the business school and asked the experts there to help them with, your, with what you were dealing with and, and, and how to develop and, yeah. and go through this process in the business world so people in the audience can relate to that were there similarities to what you did prior to this job what type of people did you reach out to when you i would imagine that's not a new process for you no but but this was way this was so much better yeah um so much better that uh because i had true expertise in those who teach and lead and uh so i'm, I'm very fortunate that the university had those those assets and resources available to me. So, and, and quite honestly, if any local business was to reach out to the to their local university, there's more than likely some type of relationship uh, that could happen there uh, where they could get that help. Well, don't get me wrong. What I've produced or funded and produced with uh, with the business school was meant to commercialize. Yeah. So now they're they're ready and armed. They've done other things. But what came of this, Scott, to me, which was sort of validating as well, I got asked to be a keynote speaker in Santa Monica, California with all Division I ADs. And it was this talk about what we've gone through here, how we turned it around so quickly. And I was, I was able to tell them about how we created a program called Winning Through Virtues um, through the business school. And that took all those ethics and values and culture, jammed it into a program and they now can tap into it. And it doesn't matter whether it's Ford, locally, or UPS, or whether it's, at that time, it was USC where Lynn Swan was, and they were debating whether they wanted to replicate what we've done. And we had ADs coming to say, let me have a copy of that brochure, which I have one I can show you. Yeah. Um, they wanted to figure out, how the hell did you all do that? And how did you do it so quickly? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the turnaround, I don't want to say, things in the past were forgotten already, but at least from a fan standpoint, uh, it almost feels that way. You, When you walk into the stadium uh, this year, it's translated to the sports teams For as sure. well. And so when you walked into the stadium this year as a football fan, before the first snap, you could, now it was Notre Dame, so it's obviously a, a Yeah, but big, there was things going on. But it we felt did. different. Yes. And, and so there wasn't a... Uh, and we had no reason to, to feel bad the year before or in the first game, but that felt different too. Yes. Uh, and so it was completely different vibe. So a lot of what you can do from a business, you can differentiate. We struggle with how do we find what makes us different? How do we find what makes us unique? And the easiest way to do that and differentiate yourself is through your own people and the culture you build. I'm not saying building the culture is easy. Yeah. But once you do that, that becomes a very easy way to differentiate yourself. Would you agree? Well, well, yes, because principle number one is who you recruit. Who and I, you well, hire. That, you just went right into. Yeah, I didn't even no, get to I, ask the question. But that because it, it walks right into it. it is <laughs> like what is the number one principle when it comes to building a, a, a winning culture? Who you recruit, who you hire, is going to shape your culture. And you can say culture is what you tolerate in another way, which, um, which is our our president uses that term. But I've always in business felt like. Who you recruit, who you hire into these positions are just going to shape your culture. Like I can put out all the value-based stuff with goals, but if they're not on board and they don't fit, then you got a problem. I mean, you're you because one can't the old phrase one can't make a team, but it can break a team. Yeah. It really can in leadership, and I think that's principle number one for me. And I've learned that because I've, that's probably where I've made like I'll say one of the biggest or mistakes along the way. 
when I was young, I was put in, a, as you could tell, a lot of responsibility at a young age. I was in over my head at times. I was just a good leader. I was a team captain in college, high school, student council, lead. I did all that stuff. Leadership to me came easier than most. Um, but that doesn't mean I didn't get into positions where I was like, I had to quickly learn from others and be quick on my feet. But there were times where I'm like, I get, I get enamored with the resume of somebody. And I'd hire, you know, at a... They look good on paper. They look good on paper. You hire glamour. And you hire out of convenience. Somebody knew somebody really quick. And you didn't stick to... So I learned by my own mistakes. It was probably my biggest mistakes early in my career was hiring out of convenience. And it, it fouled the culture. So I learned that if you're thoughtful and you really establish, like when I hired Scott Satterfield as our football coach in that Great press team. conference, I noted the criteria I had for the job, and I, I was disciplined to stay to that criteria. NFL guys wanted it. Top Division One coaches wanted it. This is a cool place. We don't pay minimum wage here. Yeah. Um, all those things fell into it, and I was I stuck to the criteria, and we got our man, and it fit. He fits, and we're, it shows. He fits into the community well. Uh, Clearly, I think a lot of what that feeling, I, tr- I, can't, I you can't really describe it, that you felt inside the stadium, um, because it's not like we had high expectations in terms of wins and losses going into this year. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Fans did not. Yeah. But we still were excited about the team and the direction. The trajectory certainly changed. And it was because of the person you hired. I, I think he was all in. He was engaging. Um, so I, I get what you're saying. In, in that aspect. So, you know, we, we've interviewed before and did a show on, on company culture uh, with a guy that I think is an outstanding expert, and, that, and that's Sandy Cerami. Mm-hmm. Um, he deals mainly in auto in the auto space, but talks a lot about what you just said, and that is you've got to get out of this hiring. Auto dealers, they hire out of desperation a lot. I need bodies on the floor, I need this, I need that, and they just want to get it filled. Yeah. And instead of constantly looking and more importantly, really developing your people, I, I sold cars my one of my uh, summers, but in my uh, to my freshman and sophomore year, I'll never forget at a car dealership and worked a couple years at car dealership, and uh, so I've kind of seen that. But there was guys like, oh yeah, he's back. He's been back here three <laughs> times, and yeah. and that does happen in that business some. Um, well, I think know. I think it happens in any business. I think there's a lot yeah. of businesses that hire out of desperation. But but the key to what you were saying is all right you're starting from the right spot you've got the right person yeah but you haven't from what you talked about earlier and i want the audience to understand this is that you don't stop there you've taken the development of these people to a, a different level without a doubt so i think that's as, as we talked about professional development we've we've actually created inside our athletic department we have 15 middle managers up and comers in what's called ldi leadership development institute and when we hired Christia Worthy to lead that charge, so she's the leader that we are developing young managers today that one day will be either in senior level here or you know senior level at another athletic department. But um, they're really talented people. They had to apply to get in the role, and we created that. We, and we budgeted for it. So we budgeted for that. We budgeted for the equity compensation to get people at parity, not you know uh, playing favorites if you will. So all that's been accomplished and we budgeted for it and it's all happening today. That creates trust, that creates respect and buy-in, um, you know, in our department. So everybody knows that and that, that transparency is out there. Yeah. What would you say, what's the number two principle for a winning culture success? Well, for me, being at the top of the organizations, I've always said, find your leaders at every level because it's not, they're not all on the top of the org chart. Yeah. So you got to find who do people go, you know, not everybody in our department wants to be an athletic director. Yeah. I know that right away, um, even in my direct reports. But it certainly makes it a lot easier, I would assume, when you, like you just said, people that are scattered throughout the org chart you gotta that find are them. leaders. Because you know that some Or you got to be everywhere. Yeah, but exactly. So <laughs> as I always say, you know, like once you find them, then they, you got to leverage them and you got to bring them in and they become your apostles. Yeah. So they're the ones who are out there spreading the good word and developing your culture with you. And they got to be culture animals just like you. So for us, Valerie at the front desk, when you walk into the athletic department, she's got that reception. She's got to be able to direct people, give them answers. We got to develop her. Um, and she's a leader. Like if somebody's having a bad day, who do they go to? Right? Yeah. And if somebody's having a bad day, they're not, some people aren't as good getting out of the bad day by themselves. 
Well, I tell somebody else, you go tell them to get their head up. You go infect them with good stuff. Yeah. It's your job to get get them going in the right direction. Don't wait on it to happen on their own. So you got to recognize it and be a team player. But so that that's where when we get in and have big meetings or we're talking about change, we go to those leaders and make sure they're out there fostering goodwill and, and educating others. Yeah, it's it's interesting, interesting you say that. If we were being, you know, we were going out ready to take the court, all right, and you and I are, are starting on our, uh, in the first five there, all right, that probably realistically would not happen. I don't know if you'd make the start probably. lineup. Uh, yeah, you? <laughs> but if you had a teammate that clearly was down and not up for the game, yeah, there's no way if any competitive person, someone that wants to win, would allow that without trying to get them fired up and ready to roll. Absolutely. So I, I think it's an interesting way to take that to the business world as well. We're built different. And I just think people's, you know, everybody says Debbie Downer and all those negative Nelly and all those terms out there. But see, I believe you can influence those people. And that's, I believe you can infect them. And I believe that positive energy is a... But it's not a, always coming from you. And that's what I love. No, You're expecting other in. people. Absolutely. It's, yeah. They're accountable for what goes on in this department. That's the reason that we built our brand around that and not around individuals. And that's the thing that I think that if there's a fundamental change in what we're trying to do is we have great individual coaches. We have some great individual leaders. Uh, I get to sit at the top, but I do not want people to be about me. I want them to be about the University of Louisville and the athletic program and what we're doing here. It was here long before us, it'll be here long after us. We're just stewards in between, and if you get too caught up in your brand and how you do things and all that, um, you're gonna foul the culture. So I can't, I can't do that. So that's why I'm always pushing University of Louisville, University of Athletics and what we're doing and the people we have here. Yeah, so I wanna go back to the principle number one, which is hiring the right people, getting the right team put together. Mm -hmm. In your experience, and we touched on it a little bit, but I wanna, what happens when you break that rule? Uh, you you get a you, you got a cancer right away, yeah. and it, and if you first off if you don't recognize it, you're a poor leader, yeah. you, and others will recognize it too. But unfortunately, that's your job to deal with it. So when I say the grass will kill the weeds, sometimes you got to pull them, yeah. and it's and it's on you. But you've got to recognize it quick enough before it causes the you know detrimental things in your organization. So what would you say to people? Because there are plenty of business. Because let's face it, the person that doesn't fit isn't always. A poor performer either no from from what you know the results you expect so yeah. what would you say to business leaders that are dealing with mid to upper perform in terms of delivering results right um, there's plenty that of don't take action yeah. on on this stuff what would you say to them um, long-term effects are going to be bad you're never developed the organization you got one person that's that's not going to be, you know, in the team player, that's not sharing, you know, their best practices and all that. I just yeah. feel like they hold back the organization. Yeah. That their individual accomplishments in an organization this big or in, in individual in organizations, that even the dealerships, um, you can have that star person, but they're probably want to come in at the end of the month and nail it yeah. and not be there. They're going to show up late for me, so they're not going to be there on Saturday during the working hours. Or they're on their phone during meetings. Or... Because they're content. They know they got to, they got to, a loyal base that they're just going to go in there and and uh, and bring those customers. But I just feel like if you're doing a better job developing your culture, you're not going to be reliant upon them. And if your brand, yeah. Dodge, Ford, whatever Lexus is is strong enough, you can have enough people around there to to cover that and and do more. What do you think the number three principle business leaders need to follow? Well, to accomplish their goals, create this winning culture. So I'm I'm probably strongest on this, and not everybody's built for this. Um, fearless to make the right decision. You got to be fearless to make the right decision. And when I came into this, as we all know, the FBI had just uh, you know pointed us out. We yeah. you know asked our uh, head basketball coach, Hall of Famer, to go away. Our AD from 20 years ago away. Uh, assistant basketball coaches. I just had to suspend right away. And just to right be clear, away. you didn't have to ask them. That was done prior to you, so yeah, <laughs> you're the, not the, the bad guy. No, the <laughs> AD and the head coach were already asked, put on suspension. They Correct. were on suspension when I got here. That's right. Um, and then the rest of them I had to deal with yep. um, and, and other issues. And, and then there was other issues going on in other sports, hence we got seven new head coaches. Um, but I think 
I've been fearless about making the right decision. I keep the university as out in front of what I would, you know, what I think is right. Um, and I think that's where people struggle. Uh, economics has a lot to do with it. People are protective. They get in these jobs and they make good money and they're like, not sure I want to go down that path. I'll, I'll kick the can on that one. And uh, I'm a bit different. So people view that sometimes as like, I'm not cold to it because I think if people know what we're about. They'll understand the decisions we make. Um, I'm never going to have a unanimous vote in any decision I make in this role or any of the companies I've been in public companies. Uh, that I've been in where my decisions are exposed, but I still maintain that value of doing what's right. So if I'm hearing you right, th three key principles, I'm going to sum this up. Not that we're not done with the interview, but yeah, I'm going to yeah. sum these three up. Because I'll quick. tell you the end result. All right. So you've got, you come in and you say, I got to have the right team around me. All right. I've got to then develop and lift my people. All right. And the third key is I've got to be quick to make decisions and fearless and some of them can be uncomfortable. Correct. Right? Would you, would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. Those are, those are common uh, any place I've been, but has, was probably needed more than most. And I've done turnarounds before, but um, where we were with fans canceling donations, pledges, or yeah. season tickets, or uh, what have you, and they were more tied to individuals than they were the university. And, and I never tried to twist anybody's arm to stay. All I said was, just watch what we're doing. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to create that we're going to do this. By the way, the same conversation I'm having with you, I had with Mark Emmert, Donald Remy, and Oliver Luck at that time in Indianapolis with the NCAA. It's the leadership of the NCAA in November of 17, one month after I got here and said, we are going to do these things to, to make positive right. changes. And we're going to go from what you may view as the toilet to the top, where we we just lost our banner or losing our banner on probation and we have another round I want to be clear as a issues. fan that I still feel that we are champions. I know you I, may I do not, too. Okay, so you're I allowed to too, say yeah. that. I didn't know yeah. what you're allowed to say. No, I So I feel we all we're know that we are yeah. 2013 yeah. national champions. Yeah, we beat Michigan. I was you know, <laughs> we can all say we were there and watched it or whatever, I, but I enjoyed yeah. that game in front of my television with my final pour of my Pappy 23 and nursed it to the end of the game. Yeah, no, that's good. Well, we nursed some Pappy after we beat North Carolina State and became bowl eligible this year. So that's good. I poured a bottle of my Pappy in the Gatorade cups one ounce at a time. So that's awesome. It's a good, uh, proper way to celebrate. What do you think, what mistakes do you think that business leaders make that cause them a lot of anxiety and stress? Uh, lack of preparation, I would say, is what causes stress. Um, whether they're going into a meeting, uh, getting ready for a presentation at a board, um, sales meeting going to present a vision, a plan. Uh, lack of preparation is what I think gives people angst. So I prepare for, for everything. Yeah. I mean, I prepare for this. I prepare for when I speak during the week, who the audience is. I ask lots of questions before I get there so I know who I'm presenting to and, and what they're interested in, whether it's to uh, you know high school alumni last week or to Breakfast of Champions or the Rotary Club or to GE or to Ford or UPS. Yeah, and let's yeah. tie this back to culture. So you're a business leader, you're running a company, you're managing something, you go into, first off, it's not like everybody loves meetings, right? No. You I, gotta, yeah. You're going into meetings and you go in unprepared. How do you see that impacting the culture and morale of the, the, the team? Well, I think it's, the that's an example. They don't have to be prepared because what happens is now you got a really inefficient meeting yeah. because I'm going to have to start asking questions to catch up. Yeah. And everybody's like, oh, God, he, he didn't even, he don't even know what we're talking about, didn't come in here prepared. I sent him emails with all the information, he didn't look at them, those spreadsheets, he didn't even know he has them. And that's unfair to them. So I think it teaches them to be prepared, be on your toes. And when they come to meetings, I, they have a understanding, they better be prepared or it's not gonna be a fun meeting. Yeah, It's not, because I'm, I have no problem calling out situations or calling out when we're not doing well. What kind of situations, or where do you see a lot of business leaders wasting time? As Working it alone working alone. Yeah, I see a lot of leaders who take it upon themselves. They don't know how to lead. They don't know how to develop people. They try to come up with all the answers themselves. And now they're preaching rather than collaborating. And it's a, it's a really lot of waste of energy. It takes so much longer to get to the decision, the right answer, if they're working alone. Well, and then they overanalyze. They, 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 
sometimes it actually never actually happens. They want things to be so perfect rather than just getting things launched out and go. Yeah, and I think that they just, when you're not collaborating, you're not getting all the facts. And, and look, great leaders have great intuition in their belly, right? You don't, some of them don't even need analytics. They're so good. Yeah. Um, but we, most we all, do. Just from a company that does specializes in data analytics, you, know, you always need that. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> you know I'm big on it. Come for the private equity world. We analyze everything. I'm, so. Everybody walks in a gate. I'm finding information. I want to know how often they're there, what they buy, what they went to the concession stand. Do they own Louisville swag? Uh, no, but I think that I think a lot of leaders still, it's, it's, it becomes reliant upon them. You see it in family businesses um, where they have trouble transferring to the next generation. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, working alone and, and trying to come up with all the answers is really a, a bad long-term solution for any organization. Okay, two-part question. What big rule in terms of building a winning culture have you broken in the past? How'd you recover? And... And, well, one part question, I guess. Yeah. How'd you recover? How'd you fix it? Well, I think uh, I mentioned earlier hiring out of convenience. Yep. I knew somebody, and uh, and I hired him into a senior sales role. Yep. And uh, they had, had been successful at the other company, and I, our companies were very similar and thought yep. they could lift us. There's no way that there's one person out there listening to this that where that has not happened. Yeah, and I, but what you do about it is important. Yeah, so how did you recover from that? Um, and I think that I, I recognized early enough that I didn't know the individual like I thought. Yeah. Um, they had some personal baggage um, that was there, and they weren't quite, quite the leadership that I thought. So, um, you know, they had great success. They've been with great products like we had and, and uh, services and all that, but they were not the right fit, and yeah. I, had to go, I had to go deal with it. And so that goes right back to your principle number three. Yes. Making decisions. And we made the decisions. change. But it, but it educated me because it was an important hire at that time. And I, and I knew I fouled. But I had to admit that to the rest of the team. I made a bad decision. I made a bad hire. Yeah. And we made a change in that position. And we were way more thoughtful about it. It made me force myself to come up with the key criteria for that job. And I always say, have five. You can have more, but I always try to say, like, what are the five criteria for the best fit in that role? And we went and made a great hire. Let's talk a little bit of, about that. I was going to say, if, if number one principle for you is is building the right team, getting the right people on, on board, I, I've yet to meet anybody that's great at hiring. However, um, you've done a great job here, two very public hires that have been outstanding. Uh, I have no idea behind the scenes all the all the changes that that have happened, but whether it's here or in your in your prior life in the business world, what uh, not I don't. By the way, this is big business, so we shouldn't act. Yeah, like it's no, not. it's it's complex. <laughs> it is. It's a kind of a complex business, and because uh, you have all these different sports and all these different constituents. So what you just mentioned, you know, you've got this. You, you try to isolate down on the criteria. What helps you hire and find the right people? I what's, think, what's the couple rules that you have about that? Well, I, I'm very disciplined to the criteria first, almost to a fault. But it's, it's rewarded me with great fit, great talent, great outcome. So now I'm, I'm, I've polluted myself to believe in it. You know? yeah. so, um, but I think that it's worked for me in business. And I, the, the last place I was a CEO before I jumped in the private equity as a board member, um, there's now four... CEOs that came out of that oh, and wow. I think that the hiring being involved with people or developing people around that um, Norm Hollinger is now running Broder as a CEO and John Hayes is president of LAT Sportswear so those let, kind of people let's that, take one of those you're going back let's take you back to when you were hiring those and you name these criteria like what were some of the criteria then uh, you don't need to say for what position and who they were, but yeah. but what what uh what were some of the specific criteria that you said I'm not bending, got to hit this hit this. What was that? Yeah, well, part of it is development. You okay. know, one is have they had any experience in developing people? Okay, you know, that's thing. Obviously, you want the the personal side of it, which Depending goes to your you want someone because that goes to your principal number two. You got it. All you right, you got it. So I think in in the position I'm thinking about that I hired. The financial acumen was really important yeah. for that, that okay. they would buy into use of technology and analytics. And I think that was that was key for that position. Um, 
uh, multiple lines. Had they ever managed multiple lines of business? Okay, uh, was key. You know, if it had, had they done that or not, because if they'd just been a hero in one line of business, not the complexity, I think was was pretty key to that. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to think like what else in and that. And these change according to the position you're hiring. They for. do even with like Scott Satterfield. That was a key. Like you know, had he been a head coach, you know, uh, in that criteria. Yeah, let's go. Have to that. have a have to be a head coach before. Yeah. Have to have been a winning head coach. Show where they develop talent, continuity in staff, um, understand the the dynamics of a budget inside this. So had they had they been in a budget, had they stayed within the budget, um, you know, so I could look and see the recruitment certainly was some. But Scott had worked in a tight budget and adhered to that. He had continuity of staff. People loved working for him. Yeah. He had been a winning head coach. He took over. He had been a great player, but he took over as a winning coach. He took a FCS program into the FBS. And then quickly they became a winner, and they were winning, winning, winning. And the recruitment they had done it so it was sustainable. So I think all those things were important. Um, he was a build up, not a tear down coach. So he builds people up, which were about positive energy, because yeah. I always be believe in that. And it's not a tear down. Um, you know, they're they're not f bombing guys to get them to, you know, fight for you. Right. It was a build up. So it it and he believed in the same values I have. The leaders at all level. When I talked to him, he said, we break down the locker room into 10 pods. There's 10 different leaders that I rely, rely upon to keep that locker room intact and to keep them all up at a high level. So when we started talking, I realized we had very common values. And I was like, "This, he's the guy, he's the fit. I, I love the relationship between sports and business and, and the things you can learn. They, they both can learn from each other. So when you think about football, you don't think that they take, you know, you mentioned the 10 pods and so. Yeah. You just don't think they take things to that level. You you think of him as all right. He's a, he's a very organized. He coaches at a fast pace in practice, right? They're disciplined. Uh, they get their teams fired up. They recruit well. Yeah. But you don't. Those are things that are done in the business world, and so I love how sports will model things they see in business and vice versa. I think I think business takes a lot from sports. Sure. And All the analogies. Yeah. So, yeah. so but he, but he, you know, and Scott's a love on your people, trust your people, respect your people, and you build that in, and that's what we were already doing here. And then when he said those, that I mean, so many lights were going off while he spoke, um, and all the analytics I'd done with him, being you know number three in defense and number one in offense and third down conversions and all this stuff, the run to pass ratios that we needed in that position yeah. for what our fans are used to and where I thought his offense would fit us. All those other factors just started snowballing. I was like, we got to have this guy. Well, and you mentioned the staff um, and the loyalty there. I've never seen a fan base more excited about the assistants. Yeah. Not that they're more excited than, he, than, than the head, but Usually, you don't. You're indifferent to the assistants yeah. in, in some manner, so unless they're pretty high profile. Well, and so this fan base knows these assistant head coaches um, are excited about it, and most people view it as the best coaching football staff we've ever had, top to bottom. Well, I'll I'll relate this to what we did. Our marketing strategy was to not run from where we were at two and ten and the issues we had in the program. It was to talk about where we were going and how we're going to build on it. And we introduced those assistants to you. You didn't, the, what was different was us, our approach. Yeah. We took a different marketing approach because we wanted all of our fans and donors and everyone else to be invested and engaged with our program and know the type of people we brought in the program because we knew that their concerns are the type of people we had had in the program. And they weren't all bad. Uh. But, um, but I felt like we had to introduce all these great people to our fans and now they know them. And I would say the same for the analogy for the dealership. We always see the owner of the dealer doing the commercials. Yeah. But how many times do you see the others engaged and being promoted through social media and other things to know who's leading the service department, who's an F and I, you know, whatever it is, uh, yeah. you know, the different sales managers that are a part of the program, used and new, or whatever's happening, or just somebody who's the feel good person in the in the dealership. Well, and to that point, so I've got three Honda stores. Um, we literally, and I post this constantly on, on social media stuff, showing examples of this, but we do, we run commercials 
of not just our management team, but of our salespeople, and they talk about the culture of the store, why they like working there, and, and what excites them most, and, and things like that. And they're quite honestly, they're some of our most popular commercials. Yeah. So uh, to that point, I agree. I think that's very important. So you, you got to get the whole team involved and, and recognized. Well, I think once you get all that going, and it's kind of where maybe some of this cultural stuff leads to is when I got here, they talked about, you know, we're never going to be able to have a winning team again like this in basketball or we'll never be able to raise the money that the past administration raised. Fan base is going to go down, team performance, all that. So how has that gone? So today, because of our culture and what we've done and moving up, we're number one in NCAA in community service with our student athletes. Just came out last week, number one. Number eight in the Learfield Cup standings. Last year we were 44. The year before I think we were 30-some. But we always finished in the 30-something. We're number eight today, and we have preseason number one baseball, two top ten swimmings, two top ten basketballs yet to report their results. Uh, softball will be up there as well. So, and athletically we're there. Um, community that we're there. GPA is the highest in the ACC at 3.2. We were 3.254 the year before, 3.2 in the fall. Let's make a point. When we were trying to get into the ACC, uh, when the university, I say we, when the university was trying yeah. to get into it, that was a, the academic side was a, a factor and yeah. in, 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 in an obstacle or hurdle we had to overcome. Right. So, so now we're viewed differently in the ACC with, with student athletes at a 3.2 and our, our graduation success rate at 91%, which is huge. And then 14 of our teams had a perfect APR score academically, heading towards gra- I mean, for graduation success. So I think that how does that help you in other aspects of how does all that? that that's great. Fans love that. They can take a lot of pride in that. But you running this department, right? This this organization. How has that helped? Because as business leaders, people want to be a part of it. Yeah, people want to be a part of that. We have today, and you know, Mark Crabtree is our Crabtree is our men's golf coach, and he's retiring in June. We haven't posted a position, but the inbound calls from head coaches and uh, top assistant coaches from top programs, without saying a word, because now people know in the NCAA what Louisville's all about and what we're trying to do. They know how we treat people. They know we've gone through this values-based, goals-based organization. Financially, by the way, we're on track, and we had a record-setting time in raising money. So all the output that when I started the process of developing values and goals was to talk about these intangible things were going to lead to tangible results that you've never been a part of before. Now they got to believe me, yeah. right? And I got to and I got to put up for it. So 2 years later, the tangible results are here and that's where it's fun. Like all those people that were here during that time are going like it's wild. Like they now go like it's they're they're infected, right? So now it's like this thing where everybody's on board with it and I always tell them like leadership is transferable I can transfer my skills to you you can now lead this department wherever you are and that's what we've done is it's now embedded in the organization where all those things happening are producing all these tangible results where we're viewed as like an amazing athletic department now what do you think most business leaders refuse to acknowledge or don't want to face kind of just bury their head in the sand personnel issues uh, HR is the, probably the one that, for most, they don't want to deal with. Um, it may be um, they're just not comfortable with it, uh, believe it or not. Even though they've risen to a nice level and gotten there, um, usually it's by their individual results or something else. But HR is probably the most difficult one that people don't like to deal with, even when they see that they're like there's an issue there, either a weak link or just a bad person. And... Um, that's that's the one I see that where why it's one of the reasons I introduced conflict management as a training tool yeah. that we had five session five sessions on it with our athletic department because if they if they see there's an issue there they'll they're more likely to deal with it. How do you keep up with it? All right, so you did your five sessions, but you're going to have some turnover, yeah. right? So you got one or two people coming in that are new. How do you keep up? So you want them to go through the same training. Absolutely. So how does that happen? Is it just constantly ongoing that five times a year everyone's participating in this, even people that have run through it before? Or how, how does that work? Well, part of it is making sure that the department heads are the apostles, right? So those people have to communicate. 
it's on them we're holding them accountable to make sure that in their department because some departments have more churn than others yeah. to make sure they're doing it at that level and if not then we bubble up to the the broader level where we're doing the training you can't it's not one and done with this you have to have ongoing training because there is going to be some turnover and i think there's new nuances to that 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 happen along the way but it's been successful for us and in decision making because we say if you have that empathy when we're making big decisions on key initiatives you really understand all sides that are in that decision making and you can apply it back to tell me which values and goals that applies to we're going to have a great outcome yeah. and that's where we are that's nice what um is there anything i haven't asked you that you could think of about creating a winning culture that you think would benefit business leaders yeah I mean, I, I think that you have to be committed to that process and I think there is as I say like and I, and I, I don't mean I'm not I like a lot of things that NCAA does for its membership but I'm critical of the sense that um, I believe a process like this will trump penalty and you can go say that's not good um, we need to have bigger penalties um, that's like you telling Zach you came home late for curfew one week you're grounded and then next week, you're after he gets off, you're like you're waning, and it's getting close to midnight curfew, and you go like, I can't wait. I got him again. I'm going to give him <laughs> two weeks of of being grounded this time, rather than saying on a my process, punishment. I made him do push-ups until exhaustion, until yeah, he couldn't well even that, do one. There you go. That may work too, but um, but I would say that you he only say, did six. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's out of conditioning. That's not out of spite. But I I think you got to. I mean. That, that would be the point is like, Zach, you're Gabby, you say, you know your curfew is 12, but 11, you call me or text me and tell me right. where you're at, and then I know you're going to be home at 12. Because you as a parent are going to rest easy. That they're gonna, right. You know they're going to be home at 12. Rather than you sitting home at 12, anxious and worried, right. are they going to get here? And it's not that you really want to give the penalty, but you're worried. Yeah. And I feel like that same kind of thing, and this is maybe a little cavalier to look at it that way, but I don't. that's where I feel like process – in what we're doing and some of the maybe fundamental changes what's happening in collegiate athletics will mitigate having to always just say more penalty, more scholarship, more fine, more Well, hopefully some whatever. of the changes that are probably going to happen here in the next five years will go that direction. Well, I hope so. And I think that's why I'm spending the time with other ADs speaking and, and, and even with the NCAA. I mean, I, I know they've got a business model run too. And, um, I don't want to be too naive to how it all works, but I've learned a lot about it, but I also know how you overhaul a company and overhaul, in this case, some things we've done here. Not all, because there's a lot of great things here that I got to inherit, but but I also, you know, I didn't come into this just to be an AD. I wanted to help the university and help our community, but in the same vein, I've now learned where I can be helpful to the ACC and the NCAA. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Vince for an outstanding interview. Great job. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for the time. And I want to thank the MCC audience out there for listening and tuning in. We'll catch you next time.